Glory to Jesus Christ. So we have our Bible study on 1 Timothy. And as we can say our prayer of the Holy Spirit. Today is Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your word. Make it a living reality in my life, a constant guide at my side, as a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Open my heart, O Holy Spirit, to receive your word. Make my will strong, Holy Spirit, to follow wherever you lead. That's from Devotions to the Holy Spirit from Father Brian Moore, S.J., from Pauline Books and, Public and Media. And today, among the saints, we commemorate St. Frumentius, who was a uh, the great evangelist of Ethiopia. So in the, in the tradition in the time of Constantine the Great in the fourth century, he went uh, on a mission to Ethiopia, but was taken a prisoner. And uh, he and his brother who were uh, Youths were uh, set aside as slaves and were brought to the king of Ethiopia in, in Aksum. Uh, and the and eventually they uh, rose in court and Saint Frumentius became the treasurer in Ethiopia and his brother Adasius became the cupbearer to the king. On his deathbed, the king gave them their liberty. But they stayed at court due to the entreaties of the queen to assist her uh, in the government. And St. Frumentius did all he could to promote the Christian religion. And with the accession to the throne of the young king, Aizan, Adasius returned to uh, Lebanon, where he became a priest. And St. Frumentius went to Alexandria with St. Athanasius, consecrated him bishop for the Ethiopians. Returning to Aksum, the saint gained a number of a people at court, of influential people, to the faith. He governed his flock with zeal and holiness until his dead, death which occurred accord toward the end of the fourth century. Let us pray. Grant, we beseech you, almighty God, that as we remember blessed St. Frumentius, your confessor and bishop, we may, may increase our devotion and further our salvation in seeking your will. May we, like him, share Jesus with others. We ask your blessing upon the Ethiopian churches and the Ethiopian and Eritrean peoples. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're on, in 2 Timothy, on the fifth chapter, which if you have the New American Bible, the St. Joseph edition. Uh, it's on page 325. Of course, it depends on what edition 
that is page 325 at the bottom. So where is this chapter 5 beginning with the first verse? Do not rebuke an older man, but appeal to him as a father. That's uh, something that uh, we're losing in the, uh, the Western cultures is uh, any respect for uh, older people or concern for them. Uh, and uh, uh, any consideration that they may have wisdom from experience of all that, the, uh, the youth idolatry that, you know, adoring everything that's young and acting as if the, you know, a teenage is the height of awareness and knowledge and everything, rather than uh, a stage one has to get through uh, to come to greater maturity. Treat younger men as brothers rather than as rivals. Older women as mothers, the sense of family in the Christian community, and younger women as sisters with complete purity. So, and, and this is not just his advice, Paul, the Pauline advice to Timothy, but the advice of scripture to all of us as we live in, in the in community of the community of the church. The commentary in the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible This is, Paul instructs Timothy on how to treat older and younger believers, the widows, elders, and slaves. He leads in with a reminder that every Christian under his care is a member of the spiritual family of Christ. And the Jerome Biblical, this is the original Jerome Biblical Commentary, not the new Jerome. I prefer this one, actually. The Christian community is compared to a large family. Do not rebuke an older man. The context shows that here the term presbyteros, presbyteros has the general meaning of older man, but as we've discussed before, it can mean a priest, the uh, second level of holy orders, the ordained elder, the outward priest, in fact, comes from presbyteros, from pres with the Latin presbyter. And uh, he said, do not rebuke the elder, so don't, don't humiliate the, per the older person in that way, but uh, exhort him nonetheless, if it needs to be corrected or, or encouraged or whatever is needed, the, the pot of clay, clay uh, he uh, gives an exhortation, he gives something that would be a, uh, a call to the, uh, the, that's the root word there, the Greek word for call is, in, is the root word there. And uh, at younger men, that the word used really would be, you know, neotero, teperos, neo, neo, Teros. As I said, we could they get the print smaller in this thing? And, it, and they do the Greek in italic, so it makes it even harder to see it. And I, my eyes have actually even improved over time. But anyway, so but as a, a brother, a Delphos, to, to as really family, that's a sense of, of of equals, even a younger person. And in the culture, the younger brother was 
subject to the older brother. This was true in the Semitic as well as in the, the Greco-Roman cultures. Uh, and it was patriarchal, the family system, the father at the top, and then in the extended family, the grandfather, the uh, esteemed elder would be at the top of that, at the top of the clan. So then it, the, it goes into about the older women there. The uh, commentary in the New American just said the footnote there. After a few words of general advice based on common sense, the letter takes up several aspects. First, the subject of widows. The first responsibility for their care belongs to the family circle, not to the Christian community as such. The widow, left without the aid of relatives, may benefit the community by her prayer, and the community should consider her material sustenance, its responsibility. Widows who wish to work directly for the Christian community should not be accepted unless they are well beyond the probability of marriage. That is 60 years of age. Married only once and with a reputation for good works. Younger widows are apt to be troublesome and should be encouraged to remarry. That would be, so we will see if they're troublesome or not. Then, uh, where's the, where it is? This is verse three. Honor widows who are truly widows. So by that, they mean widows who really don't have people they can depend on, who don't have uh, uh, older children that who can support them, or an extent, you know, brothers, etc. People who could uh, help support this person. But if a widow has children or grandchildren. Let these first learn to perform their religious duties to their own family. And that's something we often need to, to learn. And sometimes ministering in one's own family is sometimes harder because they know how to push our buttons. They know our faults and stuff like that. And as they say, familiarity breeds contempt in some ways. And, uh, the, uh, and so they often don't... Uh, take as well to that. But the parents have a very definite duty before God to instruct their children and not to <coughs> stop that when they become older, especially when they're teenagers. They really, really need instruction. They really, really need direction, especially as we're in the uh, culture of death. Uh, a culture that uh, glorifies superficiality, a culture that uh, applauds and even pushes uh, things like uh, drunkenness, uh, drug taking, all of this. Well, at the same time, they often say, oh, no, no, that too. But that's often hypocritical. The uh, alcohol consumption and at an early age is very profitable to uh, many people here. And the same thing with drugs. Often, uh, and it's a lot of this stuff of legalization of marijuana, I can't figure that out uh, anyway. I, it, does, it seems to lack the slightest sense. I'm not talking about medical use of it, just the uh, medical use of it and stuff like that, but uh, the recreational use of it. So, uh, so we parents really need this, and older brothers and sisters 
need to look out for their younger brothers and sisters in, in our culture. Although often they, you're lucky to have a brother or sister uh, nowadays. That's, that's not fashionable. Uh, that uh, one child at most for, for many are pushing that rather than the uh, seeing that you know, having a number of children would be a, a quiver fill, full of arrows, as the Psalms tell us, the, of, of, of a benefit. So, um, but uh, to reform our religious duty to our own family. So, as this, this, the saying goes, charity begins at home. To make recompense to their parents. For this is pleasing to God. So, just as our parents had to take care of us, so when in their age we have that responsibility. Our first, resp first responsibility of, of a parents is to their children, not to their pa their parents. Uh, but uh, that shouldn't be in contradiction. But this is pleasing to God, and it's a commandment. Honor your father and your mother. It just doesn't mean, you know, be polite to them. It means be helpful to them. To glorify them, literally. It says, the real widow who is all alone, has set her hope on God, because who else is there in this? And continues in supplication and prayers night and day. So that the widow supported by the community basically enters, I don't, we don't know if the Ordo Viduarum was established at the time of the writing of First Timothy, but the order of widows, which was like like nuns, they were that, and their uh, main function was prayer, but also they were to be uh, a charitable help for for others. They were to do according to their health, uh, so because some were very enfeebled, and so prayer would have been their whole thing, and since and. Uh, the order of widows is fairly early, but as we said, we don't really know if this if there is such a is order here. But they do take vows of of a commitment to God, uh, involving celibate chastity, and we can see this because uh, Timothy discourage uh, Paul rather or the Pauline writer discourages younger widows from uh, making their final professions, so to speak. Uh, and because he said that they could be tempted and then they'd go off and violate the vows that they made, but they wouldn't be violating their vows if they didn't make them. So they would be free to marry because their spouse is dead. And that, you know, especially if they have children, that might be helpful children or all the stuff or if she doesn't have children if she's of childbearing age then that would be what was uh, expected socially and culturally not just in the Jewish culture but in the Greco-Roman culture as well so uh, they didn't have the the prejudice against remarrying that you found in Hindu culture for example where a widow was not to do that. In fact, you even had the uh, the extreme in some cases of a basically human sacrifice of the widow with the 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 dead husband. The, no, they didn't do the other way around. If the if the wife died, they didn't uh, kill the husband and send the husband off with her into uh, into another realm and to another another level of of reincarnation or something. But uh, most forms of his Hinduism now strongly condemn a sutti, that's what that was called. Uh, but there, is, there are still cases that pop up uh, about that, of that uh, in uh, India. But uh, as I said, most forms of Hinduism condemn that now. So, uh, but she's to be a, a person of prayer, a contemplative. Uh, but he said, but the one who is self-indulgent, so she's also to live a, 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 a form of an ascetical life. 
do not be self-indulgent. In fact, the, that's highly condemned here. It's that the, the, but the one who is self-indulgent is dead while she lives. And that could be really true and it was spiritually, because you know, giving in to your every whim, and uh, you know, seeking uh, the best material uh, comforts, the highest form of the uh, beyond you know one's means uh, is, uh, and especially when we have to remember that these widows are dependent on the church. For their sustenance. So if they want to, you know, live a luxurious life, they're certainly in the wrong thing. They should go and look for a wealthy husband or something at that point. And uh, there were, in Greco-Roman culture, people like Lydia, the purple de uh, dealer, who uh, was a businesswoman, apparently uh, doing very well financially with that, so that she could that she could really help out the church and the church would meet in her house, which was not just your average house, which was often just one room, but uh, it was uh, uh, with multiple rooms and probably a big uh, meeting room, function room that they could use. And uh, that often means well, this is the church which meets in the house of so-and-so. That's what it is. Uh, uh, and it's interesting, some of the uh, ancient uh, titles of a church, you know, named after. So that were often were named after saints, but were named after the patron who in whose house they met, or who gave the house over to the church. In time, you'd see that that houses were uh, transformed interiorly, and uh, it, it was uh, it, we see that in Dura Europas. The, early uh, third century uh, the uh, church there in Dura Europas with all of the icons of the walls and everything like that and a baptismal room and uh, a Eucharistic room and uh, various things like that uh, having that so so this widow it, it was it, when they're told what this widow should be doing command this so this isn't just to be, you know, winked at, command this, and uh, you know, this is really true also for, for which should be for clergy, and often in the, the history of that, the upper clergy, uh, when they got really involved in uh, the political and, and uh, economic things, often uh, neglected that for themselves. The uh, bishops with uh, living in great luxury in quote unquote palaces all that, and uh, especially when they were in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and um, in the Baroque period even, to uh, where they were, they expected to live like kings, a lot of them, and that was not what they were supposed to do. They were supposed that their uh, self-indulgence was a living death, given their vocation as, as bishops. It doesn't mean that the clergy, the diocesan clergy, who don't, don't make take vows of poverty, so should live in uh, in extreme ascetic, ascetical situations. They could live in comfort according to uh, a simplicity of life, according to a uh, a life that you know that you sh uh, it shouldn't be a life of of sought after physical sufferings. Say, but it should be a life of uh, pursuing simplicity and generosity uh, con uh, with concern for the needs of those who are much needier. <coughs> so, and uh, these communities, as they developed, often followed the advice of the Book of Acts. In which the community, there was community of goods. That is, nobody owned any private property, and they pulled that. So that is the norm in many religious orders, that you, it's, it's community of goods, that, quote-unquote, communism, if you will. So, 
and of course, in a community, if you're living together, there has to be uh, rules. There has to be rules. There have to be rules, and there uh, needs to be uh, organization with uh, with governance. There has to be governance in this. So it can't, it can't be chaos, and so the uh, so that's where the uh, the vow of, of obedience came in as time went on, or a uh, conversion of life that would, would include all of that, that they may be irreproachable. And so, and whoever does not provide for relatives, and especially family members, has denied the face and is worse than an unbeliever. So that, so, uh, you can't dump your uh, dependence on the church and say, well, uh, they can take care of them. I, I won't assist them according to my means. And, and this was not just something unique to the Christian community, the Jewish communities, this sort of thing. But even the, the pagan community, the family things, people were expected to take care of their parents, to take care of the the pagans had, uh, many of the pagans in the Greco-Roman world, had the attitude that's very common among uh, functionally pagan people today about children. So uh, if you had a ch if a child was quote unquote unwanted, you got rid of it, you killed it, and uh, abortion existed, and they had things of taking drugs to uh, to. Uh, bring about fetal homicide. But probably more common was what was called exposure, which was you, you'd ha have the child, but the newborn would be just left there. Sort of like what uh, some of our politicians are saying about children who've been condemned to abortion, but they survive it. They should be exposed. They should be just left. They shouldn't be given nourishment or anything to, for them to survive. Uh, uh, as the uh, governor of Virginia said, he said, "Oh, look, we should make them comfortable uh, and uh, and let uh, let them die." So, uh, infanticide, whatever they want to call it, they can call it whatever they want to, but it is infanticide, and it's uh, the old thing of of killing off the child that's not wanted, usually girls. I might add that the baby girls that would be found with that. There was a in um, in Gaza. Uh, there was found a, a, a sewer actually, and there were all these bones of baby boys, newborn baby boys. Well, it turned out that it was right underneath the uh, a, a brothel, so the girls could be found useful, so they could raise the girls and turn them into prostitutes, but the boys would be just a drain. So they killed them. So they just threw them into the sewer. And uh, this was very common and is not uncommon in our world today. Uh, this uh, having a, a, new, a, a newborn child and just and killing them. In, uh, in China, where they had the one child uh, law, and if you had another, they would. So if you, if often, if the child that you bore was a girl, then you exposed it, and it, that was winked at. It's apparently very common in many places in China, and apparently still goes on. And of course, we have sex selection abortions for that. They're common in many places, and uh, that's. Uh, you know, so in, in China, in India, some other, but, uh, you know, and it happens here, too. Uh, and it's said that, you know, the ab abortion advocates, for the most part, don't even criticize that. And they claim to be feminists and all this stuff, by the way. Uh, but uh, you were supposed to take care, and the Christian and the Jewish, the Jewish also, that was this uh, infanticide, exposure, abortion, and stuff like that was not approved of. And uh, there was 
uh, not, shall we say, me medical clarity about uh, the preborn child. You know, when at one point does it become a child? And we would say, well, from the moment of conception. But they didn't know about genetics. They didn't know any of it about this stuff. So often they were considered what they would say, ensoulment, whether the soul would come into, there's a spirit would come into the, into the child. So, and before that, someone said, well, it's not murder before that, but afterwards it would be. So, and often they say, when the child starts to stir around, they would have that. And, uh, <clears throat> but the Christian church, even in these confusions, always maintained that abortion was evil and exposure of children was evil right from the beginning that was uh, that uh, it would not conform to the culture in that area let a widow be enrolled we would say uh you know this is you know put on the quote unquote the dole for the uh and supported but this enrollment here would be like, uh, you know, a, a, a consecration, consecration to the Lord there. So it's interesting to be a King James says, let not a widow be taken into the number. So up to that, into the uh, into the order of widows, so to speak, until she's 60 years old. And and the uh, the early modern English, I like it says, uh, three score years old. So a score is 20, so that's <coughs> Three there. But let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than sixty. Let if she is not if she is not less than sixty years old. So so uh, at sixty, they said, well, the likelihood of of uh, getting married is would be it was much much slimmer than before that. So uh, married only once. Well, if you're if you've been married, you've been widowed twice, and you're in a desperate situation. What about that? I'm sure they would have taken care of that person, but this person wouldn't be uh, uh, brought into the person wouldn't be brought into this uh, order of widows there this uh, uh, particular way. And uh, it said with a reputation for good work. You know, that she was a worker, not lazy, and doing good things, doing good things for a neighbor, doing good things for people in the church. And one thing it says, namely, that she has raised children. So what if she's had no children? Well, that, uh, someone who had, had no children uh, and wasn't able to raise children if they died early, which was very common. Uh, uh, I'm sure they would practice hospitality. Who could be, you know, good not wouldn't be a grouchy charity distributor, but uh, hospitable. Wash the feet of the holy ones. So uh, this doesn't mean just literal washing the feet, but it would be uh, nursing uh, of people. The holy ones here would be the the uh, hoi hagioi would be the the people in the church, the uh, active people in the church. Uh, but washing the feet meant much more than that. It meant taking care of people, uh, uh, comforting them, things like that. Nursing, as I, I pointed out, that would be uh, one of these vocations. So we see this in the religious life, especially in the 17th, 18th century, 19th century, uh, the active orders of, of women, women, religious active orders, 
uh, doing these roles in the church, the roles of the spiritual and corporal work of mercy, teaching, nursing, a caring for orphans, uh, what we would call social work today, various things like that. Help those in distress. Involve yourself in every good work. So let's see what different translations say about that. These uh, four translations I have here. Let a widow be put... Oh, this is the New Revised Standard Version. Let a woman be put on the list. If she is not less than 60 years old and has been married only once, she must be well attested for in good works as one who has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to doing good. in every way. A widow under 60 years of age should not be put on the roll. An enrolled widow must have been the wife of one husband and must have gained a reputation for good deeds by taking care of children, by showing hospitality, by washing the feet of God's people, by supporting those in distress, in short, in every good deed at every opportunity and the New Jerusalem. Enrollment as a widow is permissible only for a woman at least 60 years old who has had only one husband. She must be a woman known for her good works, whether she has brought up her children, been hospitable to strangers, and washed the feet of God's holy people, helped people in hardship, or been active in all kinds of good work. And let's look at the commentary in the Ignatius Study Bible. Widows had special needs in ancient society, where no economic or governmental programs were in place to assist them. Paul advises different support systems for different circumstances. Widows with a surviving family should be cared for by their children and relatives. Older widows without family or wealth are to receive material support from the local church. Younger widows are advised to remain, to, re, uh, to remarry, lest their energies and idle time be spent in hunt wholesome conduct and conversation becoming uh, and to, to the widows who are enrolled are to engage in prayer day and night a good example is the aged widow Anna in Luke 2 37 they were in the temple with the presentation of Christ in the temple she is there she was widowed she was widowed young apparently and she and her uh, maintain this prayer life in the temple night and day. So you have the tradition of uh, praying at night, night vigils for that uh, with uh, male and female religious communities, and even some having the uh, shifts in prayer so that uh, there would be people praying constantly. So you'd have, uh, you know, sometimes it would even be in sort of three sort of uh, sub-communities that would uh, take these shifts, shifts of prayer, and then also time for work and whatever that's what they had to do, and then a sleep, uh, which is very important to get your proper sleep 
not only for your body but for your mind as well and and the the spiritual influence uh, of that and Uh, they warned about this uh, uh, living uh, superficial and selfish lives, because they would be, you know, they'd probably be lifeless, they'd be spiritually dead. Uh, but even worse than that, they would be a scandal. So that they say, well, if she does that, and she's supposed to be religious and all that, then I can uh, go along with that and be selfish, etc. Enrolled either added to a list of widows who qualify to receive assistance or registered among an organized group of widows committed to prayer. So the Ordo Viduarum. And works of service. So that the character expected of these women is compa comparable to that of a prospective bishop or a deacon. Wash the feet, an act of hospitality common in societies where sandals are worn and dusty roads are traveled on by foot. Jesus made it a symbol of Christian service in John 13, 14 to 17, at the Last Supper when he washed the feet of the disciples. So instead of the, the emphasis on the ritual washing of hands at the Seder, this, the, he, Jesus does this ritual washing of feet, which was considered degrading. Uh, so the 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 rabbi in this uh, fellowship community wouldn't be expected to be doing that. It would be a, an expendable servant to fast. But Jesus does it. He says, "As I have done to you, so you must do to one another," which was became a symbol of service, of dedicated service, uh, even of menial service, which was which uh, was considered uh, for many people uh, for lower. Ranks, but rather, in, in this, it's considered in one way one of the highest uh, functions in, in a Christian community. So then he goes on about the widows. further, but exclude younger widows, for when their sensuality estranges them from Christ, they want to marry, and will incur condemnation for breaking their first pledge, for a go against, they go, went against their vows that they made. So, uh, some actually think that that might be a good thing now in modern religious orders, not to have a uh, uh, making final vows until you're 60, but only having making temporary vows, a first for a year and, and doing that for then three years and then maybe five years or something, uh, but just renewing it, renewing it until you're 60. So they would. So if someone says, you know, "I've had it," I'm out. You just wait until your term uh, is is up, and then you can leave. Uh, in good canonical graces, you haven't taken a, 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 a vow of, of of life celibacy, and uh, and and then broke break it. And furthermore, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers but gossips and busybodies as well. So this, of course, could, could apply also to. Uh, men, uh, the uh, idle minds is the devil's workshop. Uh, gossips and busybodies, uh, like one phrase, one translation, I think it was, it is the New American, or one of the versions of the New American from First Thessalonians. Instead of being busy, they are busybodies. So with that, get, getting into the, get the, the dirt on other people and things like that. Talking about things that ought not to be mentioned. So the malicious gossip. So I would, like younger widows to marry, have children and manage a home. 
So, uh, again, this would be what St. Paul had said in Corinthians 7 about, this is more advice than certainly a mandated law. So, uh, you know, many uh, widows, the last thing they want to do is get married again or feel called to that. And uh, certainly there have been many examples among the saints of early on being totally committed to this. And then the tradition of uh, virginal dedication, virginal consecration. Uh, and that became the norm rather than the widows in, in, their, in religious life as time went on. In fact, there were some groups that wouldn't accept uh, a woman if she were had been married or wasn't a virgin or whatever. Uh, you know, look at the situation of St. Rita, who was a widow, uh, who really did seem to have this vocation, but it was tried and tried and she was rejected and rejected, but she persisted and uh, she was accepted by the Augustinians eventually. To have children manage a home so as to give the adversary no pretext for maligning us. So there's nothing like uh, a bad religious or a priest or, or cleric uh, to uh, disparage the church, to uh, malign the, even the faith. So, so well, how could they, they be? Uh, how could people say, well, uh, attack the faith over this? when they're living contrary to what the faith teaches. So you said, if you want to live a, a, a quote-unquote secular life, then go ahead, you're free to do it. But don't uh, commit yourself to this, this form of, of, don't take a vow of this. Don't be like, you know, uh, the that couple in the Book of Acts who wanted to go into the community of goods, but they didn't want to put in their full share. They wanted to be supported by the community, but they were holding the stuff back uh, for that. And St. Peter says, well, you know, you, it was yours. You didn't have to. You know, you could be a member of the community and not be in community of goods and not, you know, participate in that, live on your own. But no, they didn't do that. And then they die. They get zapped. In that uh, situation, heart attack, I would say. But uh, for some, have already turned away to follow Satan. So that's uh, so the author does not have a sympathetic view of people who make the vow, take the vows, and then violate. Go off. Because it could even be rather than even being married, just you know, going off with somebody. And that if any woman believer has widowed relatives, she must assist them. So not just the male relatives who would be considered the ones who are supposed, but let's say they don't have the male relatives, they, the female relatives should assist if they're you know, the daughter. In fact, if that was often the case, the daughter they would. Uh, the, the widow person would live with the married daughter, but even more common would have been, the expectation would have been the married son, that uh, he was supposed to take care of, of, of them. But anyway, must the system, not should the system, not if it would be nice to a system, but must the system. And so uh, the, uh, it grew up in, in the Middle Ages and uh, Often would a, a woman went into religious order or a man went into religious order. They said, oh, well, you're not responsible for your parents anymore. That really wasn't, but Jesus did not have good things to say about that. At that. So, you know, no, you're, uh, my, my goods are koban now. I, I'm not responsible to support my parents now. No, that's, that takes priority. That would take, you know, supporting your parents and your children, etc would take to, uh, priority over that uh, other thing. 
And even the you know terrible stories I've heard and true, of the uh, they said uh, you know uh, you love uh, father or mother more than me you're not worthy of me to you can't go to the funeral of your parents, or you can't uh, go off to take care of them when they're sick or something like that. That's just not that's not real religious life. I'm sorry. Um, anyway. The church is not to be burdened so that it will be able to help those who are truly widows, help those who are really in need. So uh, rather than get a free ride, uh, it says, no, the, the church, the, the, you know, the, the funds of the church were supposed to be there to help those who were really in need, not those who had uh, assistance from elsewhere. And so he goes on then for... Uh, the presbyters. These presbyters are not just presbyteroi here wouldn't just mean uh, older men. It, here, it's fairly certain that this means the ordained elders, the priests here. And priests, you know, and also including probably bishops and others like that in this context. Presbyters who preside well deserve double honor, especially those who toil in preaching and teaching. So that's one of the main duties of a priest is to preach and teach. Uh, and there are others that you know, do tend to the sick and various other things, but especially preaching in the sacramental context, the, in the, preaching in the at the, presiding at the Eucharist, that who presides well, who uh, does this devoutly and uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. That deserves double honor, especially those who toil in preaching and teaching, which of course St. Paul was doing uh, as the, this uh, missionary uh, bishop there going around. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it is threshing. You know, I don't mind being compared to an ox in that situation. Uh, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Because he said, you know, uh, take up my yoke and learn from me. He was comparing himself to an ox. You shall not muzzle an ox when it is threshing. And why is that? Because... The, uh, the ox has worked for uh, uh, you know, grinding the wheat and or all the other stuff like that. So it should have, or the, in the, the threshing floors. You know, so, so it shouldn't be muzzled so that it, it can't eat. It should be paid, so to speak. So he, he's that, that uh, the clergy who work should be supported by the community. Even though St. Paul... Uh, supports himself and elsewhere he also says yes I do I support myself so I, no one will have any I won't have to depend on anybody he was a tent maker but he said but uh, the the labor is worth his pay so that uh, they should be supported the clergy should be supported as long as they work as long as they're doing what they're supposed to be doing the uh, pastoral ministry the preaching and the teaching especially and the religious who those who are be primarily prayer uh, they should work with their hands they should support themselves so it has been the tradition that uh, but often that's this not enough you, 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 you know the uh, contemporary communities also need help and support it to, to just get by doing that as it says here a worker deserves his pay the uh, the footnote here from in the new american the function of presbyters is not exactly the same as that of the episcopos, the bishop, 
Episcopos. 1 Timothy 3, 1. In fact, the relation of the two at the time of this letter is obscure. The pastorals seem to reflect a transitional stage that developed in many regions of the church into, quote unquote, the monarchical episcopates you see in uh, the writings of St. Ignatius of Antioch. In the second and third centuries. Before that, it may have been a college of bishops, uh, and maybe with the, a bishop like Timothy as the overbishop, the quote unquote archbishop, the metropolitan uh, over them, this, and, that, and then the presbyters and, then, and the deacons. That, uh, The presbyters possessed the responsibility of preaching and teaching, for which functions they are supported by the community. The realization that their position subjects them to adverse criticism is applied in the direction to Timothy to make sure of the truth of any accusation against them before public reproof is given. And I, I wish the bishops and the, would uh, learn that now, because now if you're accused of all sorts of things, no proof, it doesn't seem necessary, not even proof. You know, proof might be hard to come by since so many of these things are he said, he said things. Uh, but there has to be evidence. It just has to be. Otherwise, it's, it's, uh, it's just unjust. For this proof. So here in, that's what uh, Timothy is advised to. To make sure of the truth and any accusa accusation against them before public reproof is given. He must be as objective as possible in weighing charges against presbyters. So you shouldn't favor them because they happen to be uh, priests or whatever, nor should it be the other way around. You should be objective. Learning from his experience to take care in selecting them. So don't just ordain anybody. You know, it should be uh, tried and, uh, and set before they'd be ordained. Some scholars take verse 22 as a reference, not to ordination of presbyters, but to the reconciliation of public sinners. Because that would be, because it'd be laying on a pants with that too. <coughs> So if you know, so uh, it, make sure these people are really repentant, which was the way it was in uh, the early public penances. But I think it's ordination. It, it, that seems to make uh, much more sense in this context. The letter now sounds an informal note of personal concern in its advice to Timothy, not to be so ascetic. Then he even avoid that he even avoids wine. Take a little wine for your stomach. Well, actually, that's I don't think that's particularly good advice as a person with acid reflux. Uh, but uh, that would be that. But uh, wine was safer than water in those days in most situations uh, to take. Judgment concerning the fitness of candidates to serve as presbyters is easy with persons of open conduct more difficult and prolonged with those of greater reserve. Do not accept an accusation against a presbyter unless it is supported by two or three witnesses. That would again be the traditional Jewish approach also in, in the cases of accusation. Reprimand publicly those who do sin so that the rest also will be afraid. So this would be for any uh, real sin, or, or grave sin. I charge you before God in Christ Jesus and the elect angels, the elect angels are the good angels there, the uh, ones who elected to stay with God and God elected to embrace them, to keep these rules without prejudice 
doing nothing out of favoritism, one way or the other. And that's been a big problem in the scandals of the last the last twenty years. That there's been favoritism, that you know, cover covering up things. And sometimes it wasn't favoritism. The person was uh, in order to avoid a scandal. But you, uh, a scandal that's buried, isn't done away with. It's planted, and so it comes. So justice, justice avoided is justice denied. And so all of that, and so and uh, often doing that, and some uh, bishops and others knew that these people were doing things and moved them around, uh, where they often repeated their things, feeling that they were now uh, they were uh, above the law, that they were they had it made that they, uh, nothing could they had were protected, uh, but that's not the way it should be. Uh, I agree with those in the Middle Ages who wanted to abolish the preference. For a, pri a privilege of clergy, which wasn't just for priests and bishops, or that you know, separate courts and things like that. The, the, the crimes they you know they should be set according to the crimes. That the, they should be treated the way anyone else should be treated with their crimes, because often the church courts tended to be more much more lenient uh, in these things. Do not lay hands, that would be ordination. But as I said, there was laying on of hands, it seems, for uh, absolution also. So some think that that <coughs> would be included in this. But I, I, I don't really see how that's... Because this, the whole context is on presbyters here. So uh, it would be ordination. Do not lay hands too readily on anyone. And do not share in another's sin. That through covering up or participating in one way or the other, either passively or actively. Keep yourself pure. So keep yourself pure, even. So that's the most important thing. It, it, that. But you can't say, well, I'll keep myself pure, but the people I'm supposed to supervise, I'm just not going to bother. But that, so that's being a bad shepherd that's letting the, the, sh the sheep Go off. Stop drinking only water, but have a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. And how do some uh, teetotaling people who say that wine is condemned uh, throughout the old, in, you, know, you, you can't take wine, that's not a, a biblical injunction. It would be, a, there's a great condemnation of drunkenness, both in the Old and the New Testament. But uh, it's not a condemnation of wine per se. Wine, wine is what Jesus used for the Eucharist. And it was alcoholic wine because no other type existed. There was no grape juice as we know grape juice until Louis Pasteur and Mr. Welch. <coughs> Keep yourself pure. But have a little wine for the sake of your stomach or whatever is needed for the sake of your stomach. And your frequent illnesses. So again, this is don't be hyper ascetic. Uh, don't harm your body uh, in an attempt in uh, misguided zeal. There, for uh, what's going on in life. So we'll stop there. But let's look at the other. commentaries here. This is the Ignatius. The elders or presbyters, priests, being servants of the gospel, they deserve our highest respect, as well as a share in our material resources. Only in extreme cases where sin is at issue, should Timothy rebuke an elder in public, Scripture says, by the time Paul wrote 1 Timothy, certain books in the New Testament were apparently being revered as part of Holy Scripture. In this passage, 
Paul seems to assume that the citations from Deuteronomy in the Gospel of Luke share the same authority as inspired writings. Some of his own letters were esteemed in this way as well. Let's see 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16. You shall not muzzle a quotation of Deuteronomy 25, 4. For Paul, permitting animals to eat while they work carries a hidden significance, now revealed by the gospel, so that it was true for oxen is even truer for ordained elders. Their work entitles them to a share in the community's food and provision. 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 10. The allegorical meaning of this Old Testament passage corresponds to the literal meaning of the New Testament passage that follows, the laborer deserves his wages, a verbatim quotation of Luke 10, 7, which uh, could well have been oral before uh, it was uh, written down in uh, the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus insists that ministers of the word have a right to fair compensation for their preaching. See the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 21-22. Two or three witnesses, judicial criteria in a Jewish court of law, Deuteronomy 19-15. Do not be hasty in laying on hands. Timothy is told to screen candidates for pastoral ministry before ordaining them by the sacramental imposition of hands, ordination. Otherwise, the hurried promotion of immature or poorly formed believers might have ruinous consequences. Consider your frequent ailments. Timothy's fragile health was a concern to Paul. He advised him to consume wine in moderation and so benefit from additional properties. Wine can sometimes offset the uncomfortable effects of drinking impure water. So often that the uh, wine would be mixed, the water would be filtered, and then it would be mixed with wine, with the alcohol to uh, kill off some stuff that might be in it. And let's look at the... here in the Jerome Biblical. Presbyters, 5, 17 through 25. Let the presbyters, presbuteroi, who rule well, be held worthy of double honor. The Greek term pres, presbuteros is used in the sense of ecclesiastical official. Honor includes not only respect, but material recompense. So honor your father and your mother, you should support them when, when they're not able to support it themselves. If they are able to support themselves well, you still have to show respect to them. As the next verse shows, the first quotation is from Deuteronomy 25, 4. See 1 Corinthians 9, 9. The second quotation is found in Luke 10, 7 as a saying of Christ. This may be well known as a quotation from an oral tradition or for, from one of the written accounts that preceded canonical Luke. Maybe, maybe not. The introductory phrase, well, it's, chances are First Timothy is after uh, Luke. In, uh, unless it's written, it, it, of course, if it's a Pauline authorship, it would be after Luke. So it would have been from an oral, oral tradition from which the, the scriptures come. The introductory phrase, scripture says, uh, does that apply just to the, the first verse, the quotation for Deuteronomy, or also from the one from Luke? The presbyters are afforded special protection against false charges, and uh, would, we would really see this. Uh, two or three witnesses required before an accusation against them is accepted. The formula is borrowed from Deuteronomy 19.15. Guilty presbyters are to be rebuked in the presence of all other presbyters. 
or all the members of the community. This procedure is extended as a deterrent for other presbyters. So the uh, sinning presbyter should be punished as a say, this is going to happen to you if you uh, do this too. The elect angels, those who remained faithful. The imposition of hands refers to ordination. Timothy is not to ordain a man before he is sure of his qualifications and that he's ready for this. Otherwise, Timothy would be responsible for the sins of the unworthy presbyter. The imposition of hands, a chiropoiesis there, scarcely refers here to the absolution of penitence. So this author is opposed to that other alternate thing or including that. The gesture of laying on of hands is not attested to until the third century in, in, in penance, in, in, in the sacrament of reconciliation. It was probably out of a spirit of personal asceticism that Timothy drank only water. For reasons of health, Paul urges him to take some wine. Timothy apparently suffered from a weak stomach, probably the cause of his frequent ailments. There seems to be a reference here to determining the qualifications of candidates for the presbyterate. Those candidates who act openly can be evaluated without difficulty. So you have to know them. There has to be. And that was one of the problems with the large classes uh, before the council, with some things that they could just be on the assembly line and just push through because the uh, professors, the spiritual directors didn't seem to know often know the well that was often the case so they could just go through so that but it's really important to assess them but uh, assess them according to not the tastes of the particular uh, vocation director uh, let alone his uh, prejudices but according to orthodoxy according to moral behavior according to personal maturity Others do not reveal themselves readily, and time and patience are necessary before judgment can be passed on their qualifications. So I better stop there. So let's pray the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we'll be on chapter 6 next week. And we might finish, or we might not finish First Timothy next Tuesday. So let's see who's waving. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Judy Hardigan, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Walter Byrne, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Uh, church members from Rickerscote St. Peter's Church over there in England, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Dennis O'Driscoll, good name there, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. So let's continue to pray for each other. God bless you. Bye now.